Hello and welcome to Catalyst MLM. I'm Brian Switchko and today on the show we have Jan Johnson. Jan was determined at a very early age to build a life of abundance for her future family. She put herself through school, got her MBA, and eventually worked her way to being the chief financial officer of a major segment of IBM. She was approached by a friend about network marketing and got started in her spare time while working 70 to 100 hours a week. She eventually became the number three earner in her first company and has been pursuing entrepreneurial ventures for the last 16 years. She's a business builder, speaker, mentor, coach, and trainer who thrives on the success of others. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much, Brian. Thanks for that introduction. Yeah, I was going through your videos again, and, and just I love the little lessons that you have because you you pack them into these little, you know, really absorbable packages that people can listen to, but then also act on very quickly. Um, but kind of rewinding back of, you know, because going back to where that uh, ability to communicate came from, the progression of your story is extremely interesting and has like a, a ton of insight in each step. So tell me more about your childhood and the origins of that passion. Okay, um, interesting, because I think all of us have our childhoods give such a deep effect, I guess I should say, on us, and if we reflect back, we can kind of see where the source of who we are today came from, and I'm a real reflective person, and so just to tell you a little bit and kind of capture it, I'm the oldest of seven children grew up extremely poor in a 900 square foot house on a really busy street and I am also severely dyslexic and so my mom when I was very very young bragged to people that I could read when I was three years old and she would read this story to me and I learned how to read it back to her and she'd have me read it to everyone. I turned the pages exactly when you turn the pages. Come to find out when I got in school, I couldn't read at all. And they put me in this very, very low reading group. And at a young age, I remember thinking to myself, I know I'm smarter than these kids. What's wrong? And it turned out that eventually what progressed as I struggled with this is that a younger sister stood next to me in a mirror at my house and had a t-shirt on that had writing on it. And she said, oh, Jan, look at how that writing's backwards in the mirror. And somehow it clicked with me that how she saw the writing on the t-shirt in the mirror was how I see everything. And so from that point forward, because they didn't really back then, dyslexia wasn't the thing that people realized and recognized. So, and I have a severe case of it. And so... What I did from that point forward is I took my homework down in the basement and I wrote it all backwards on the back side of the paper in pencil. And then I turned it over and traced it onto the front side of the paper and then erased the back side so no one would know I had the problem. So no one know that I was dumb in my mind. And I did that all through grade school, into high school, and even my family didn't know I was doing it. And constant you know, quently, consequently, what it did is it made me be a very focused person, and I learned how to, kind of like shifting a car, do it without having to concentrate so much. But to this day, I can write totally backwards, you know, from frontwards to backwards. That's how I naturally see things. And I think having that dilemma really made me get focused, because with dyslexia comes ADD. Right. And I think a lot of people in our industry are ADD. A lot of entrepreneurs are ADD. That's why we can look at the big picture and switch from one thing to another and go very quickly. But I needed something to help me get focused and that exercise doing that daily did that. Yeah. And um, so I think internally it also made me proud of overcoming something. Mm -hmm. And as the oldest of seven, you didn't get a lot of pats on the back in the family. So I had my own pride that I created my own self-worth kind of thing. Yeah, that's unbelievably awesome. Um, oh, okay. and, 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 and I don't know if you've read it, and this is a whole different conversation, but uh, Richard Branson had a very similar story. Um, also severely dyslexic and, and also from a similar uh, a similar situation and, and overcame it. And it, it's interesting hearing you say that of how you overcoming that helped you to see the power within yourself of how much, you know, you can overcome really anything. 
So, mm-hmm. so with your, with your, you know, large family and kind of, you know, small house and as a little girl, what kind of made you say that you didn't want to live like that? What gave you such a visceral mindset and connected you to that vision? You know, um, it's so interesting that you say that you didn't want to live like that because that became a mantra for me. I actually would say to myself as I experienced what was going through in our family, I was kind of the mom for the younger kids. My dad was never there, had three jobs, and my mom was kind of beside herself, if you will, packed into this little house. And for some reason, I remember I would pick up and clean and straighten the house and and do things. And I would say over and over and over again, I'm not going to live like my mom. I'm not going to live like my mom. And real interesting story is back in the day, no internet, no nothing. And I tell this today to, you know, my kids, my granddaughters, that how we learned things through the encyclopedia. And we had the World Book Encyclopedia that we got through a program that was S&H Green Stamps. My mom would go to the grocery store, they'd give you a certain amount of stamps, Mm -hmm. and you'd put them in a book and save them up. And once you got a certain amount of books of stamps, you could get something, a blanket or dishes or whatever. She accumulated the World Book Encyclopedia book by book with green stamps. So we got A, and then we got B. And then we got C. So if I was doing a report at school, and remember I had to do this backwards downstairs in the basement, I could do it on elephants if we didn't have E yet. Right. Yeah. I'd have to do it on dogs, you know, or, or you know, because we only had that much of the of the World Book Encyclopedia in yeah. the whole books of them. And so consequently, I would go through and look at these books, and I would see things. I remember looking at the Statue of Liberty and saying, oh, my gosh, you could go up in there. I can't believe you could go into that arm or to the um, Mount Rushmore. Look at that. And I'd read all about it and get into it. And then I'd want to put myself into those pictures. And I would say to myself, I'm going to have that. I'm going to go there. I'm going to see those places. And I would say it over and over and over in my head. And as a result, Brian, I'll tell you that there are many books about visualization and creating what you want by concentrating on it. And I have done it since a little girl. And I have been to the Statue of Liberty up in the arm of it. I have been to Mount Rushmore. But an interesting thing I remember one time, and you can imagine this little bitty house, and there's funny stories about it. I always try to look at things comically that I had this vision that one day I was going to live in a house that was on the cover of Better Homes and Gardens. And even that was able to be accomplished. I'm not saying that to say, oh, look at me. I'm just saying that bizarre things that you create in your mind and you concentrate on, if you put your mind to it um, and visualize it and have the emotion with it, you can make it happen. So I think as a person having nothing, it allowed me to really dream forth what I wanted with more emotion behind it. So I mean, that's, it's, I always love visualization stories because, you know, all too often people say, oh, you know, that whole, you know, attraction thing that, that doesn't work, you know, like, oh, if you think it, then it'll happen. It's like, well, you know, it, it, it does, but it's hard. It's not really tangible other than the examples. And it's hard to communicate that. So kind of stepping back and, and I want to ask a question is, uh, you were going book by book by book, and if you know you had to do a report and, and you wanted to do it on zebras and you didn't have Z yet, so many kids, I mean, help, I mean, people would just say, well, I don't have Z yet, so I can't do the report. I can't do the report. And, and they would use it as an excuse, and, and you said you just changed it. You did it on something else. Where did that come from? Because so many people would use that as an excuse. Well, you know what? I think it forced me and I'm sure a lot of people that would happen to be watching this would agree that sometimes you're forced to be more creative because of your circumstance. And so just now as you're saying that as an example, here's where my mind leapt to while you were talking. And that is that 
you know, zebras, you can think of Africa, that's A, that's at the beginning of the book. Animals are at the beginning of the book. So you say, okay, let me go there and see what I can find out about zebras in this smaller area. Mm -hmm. Certainly in Africa, they'll have something about zebras, even though it won't be the full-blown Z part of it. Kind of. <laughs> so I, I think, you know, when, you don't, when you're lacking, you're forced to be more creative. Mm -hmm. And then that creativity comes out in whatever specialization you're born with. Because I really do think that we're all born unique. And that our entire lives are really a book of stories. That's why I focus on stories in, in my blog and that kind of thing is because we are our stories. We aren't just one story. There's varying stories about us. There's our childhood, which you're asking us about. There's what we choose as a business. There's, you know, our friends and family. There's our creativity. There's our personal health and how, we, how we're um, affected by the afflictions we're born with and the things we overcome. When you look at people, I'm very, very affected by people that overcome personal things that they've gone through. Sometimes it's a physical thing. Mine was more of a mental kind of a thing. And I'm attracted to learning how people overcame stuff that they, that like you say, a lot of people would just give up. Right. And, solve. Yeah. and what the basis, I mean, I, that's, that's why I love this interview series is because I get to ask those questions and, and find yeah. out the root as to why someone, you know, got up, dusted themselves off and, and kept going. So right. on, on that same note, I mean, did you ever, I mean, this is when you were you were younger, and then you went on to, to go to college and then go and get your master's degree and then go to work. Um, but did you ever at any point think that that vision that you had of, of traveling and experiencing those things and, and basically just having that abundance in your life, did you ever think that that wasn't possible? Um, no, except I will tell you that after I achieved it, I went through a stage of feeling it was impossible to get back. And that's yet another story, yeah, okay? Yeah. And and that is that I entered IBM, mm -hmm. and I had other jobs prior to that kind of thing, but I entered IBM and now embarked on this career, and it kind of was a step along the way. I didn't walk in and see me as, you know, CFO. Right. I, each step of the way, saw me at the next step. So came in at a very low level and then thought, well, I could do that job. I was always kind of like chasing my superior, my boss, yeah. you know what I mean? And, and kind of thinking, well, geez, these people aren't really doing much. Maybe if I become a manager, then I'll be surrounded by people who are just kind of going after it. And then I'd become a manager and think, geez, these people. And then maybe if I become a middle manager, you know, and it kind of, I don't mean to sound whatever when I'm saying right, that, right. but. In the corporate world and environment, you're working your way through. And so I worked my way through each step of the way. And when I was in HR, kind of saw myself moving up that chain. And then they wanted me to move to New York. And I didn't want to uproot my family and move to New York. So I switched gears and went over to um, actually computer information systems in a whole new arena which was good for me and moved there. And then I moved into a whole nother arena and eventually got, you know, where I was in accounting, but then worked my way back through and was in finance and started with a new business opportunity that is now the largest, most successful arena in all of IBM. And it was, I was a part of starting that part up and I loved it. Well, here's what happened to me. Built a house, uh, was married at the time, and um, we had built a few houses, my former husband and I. We built a house in the mountains on 35 acres. And turned out that came to the closing table and we owed $100,000 more than what the loan was going to be given to us for mm -hmm. based on all the subcontractors and what they were billing us yeah. and me paying attention to the design of it and my former husband paying attention to the billings of it, okay? Um, and me now left with really the fixing of this situation. I've never not paid anybody in my entire life. 
And oh my gosh, what are we going to do? That timing, because timing is everything in network marketing. Because who would ask a six-figure income CFO working 70 to 100 hours a week if they wanted to join a network marketing company? Yep. But for me, the person who came to me had worked for me at IBM before, had retired, and said, oh, geez, Jan, you got to do this. You'd be awesome. I'm like, yeah, right. And But in my head was maybe this could earn something that I could have on the side to pay these subcontractors. That's exactly what happened. Because when you're making a six-figure income, you know, you've got kids' colleges, you've got the stuff that you've, you've got that money already being spent places. Right, right. So you're living to the, your amount, or at least I was. So I, um, I said, okay, you know, on a whim, I tried this. And timing was right with the company, timing was right with me, and I will tell you that it happened very, very quickly for me. In that particular company, it skyrocketed. And within one year, I matched my IBM income doing that business part-time. I'm not saying that happens to everyone. I don't want to leave that out there. And now, today's day and age with the Internet, there's a lot more where you can see that kind of thing happening. But back then, if you wanted to get some information to somebody, the quickest way to get it to them was a FedEx package. Yeah. You didn't send them to a website. You know, you had to overnight them something. And so I actually, you know, got people signed up. More money came in. More money came in. I was paying off subcontractors. Some contractors were seeing me paying them off. They wanted to know how I was doing it. They became a part of the company. Yeah. You know? <laughs> you know? And so it went very, very quickly for, for me, and I was having a blast training people, teaching people, being asked to go around and speak because we opened up different countries and flying around private jets speaking in front of 10,000 people. And seriously then took a leave of absence from my IBM job. Wait, so you were, you were in the private jets and speaking in front of 10,000 people and hadn't quit yet? Yes. <laughs> yes. And I'm serious. And um, so I, I took a leave of absence to focus on it full time. And then, oh, hard to go back. But there were some things kind of going on with the company at that time that was making me go, oh, I could see as a finance person, I could see some decisions being made. Maybe and I've got so far going on an IBM here. I want to hang on to this. So I went back kind of part time. Seriously, when I was at, I'm telling the secret here, when I was in Canada, Working on that business as we're expanding in Canada, I actually hired someone, a person, to do some of my IBM job for me and paid her. <laughs> and, and, you know, for work. But anyway, eventually left. When I became the number 10 person in that company, is when I left <laughs> IBM. And then, you know, went on up to become number three. And there were 2.3 million people in that company. Yeah. And so um, I, had, I had a blast. But what happened is in 2004, that company folded. It was a technology company. Things changed. The company folded. And I was like, what am I going to do? And I followed some people into a company that I knew wasn't right for me. But I did it. I didn't last very long because if something isn't right for me, I can't, I can't do it. Yeah. I can see myself very authentic. And so I attempted to do it, but I couldn't do it. I did it for four or five months. And then I decided to take a step back. And by the way, I am getting to your original question. So I want to okay. I I interject another question. So okay. uh, people often talk about the, the chicken list. And, you know, you make a list of people you want to talk to about your opportunity. You just signed up and you have a chicken list of the people who you don't want to talk to yet because... You're not, you're not there yet. You're not making money or you don't have product testimonials, whatever it may be. What, what did you teach other people after this fact of the person who came and approached you, the person who's you know CFO of a, a big part of IBM and successful six-figure earner? She didn't know, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but she didn't know about the whole house situation. And she didn't know your financials. She, she right. just came to you. What, what do you teach people about that, about just going and approaching? Do you know what? It's really interesting that you say that because of the fact that I, I used my own self as an example because of that. I used her coming to me as an example that you will never, ever know who would have come to me. Yeah. 
And consequently, too, because of the experience that I had had in the corporate world, and people kind of looked up to that, they wanted to get people in front of me for their examples, for their chicken list people. Oh, Jan, I have somebody who works for IBM, or I have somebody who's in Hewlett Packard, or I have somebody who's a real, you know, a successful realtor. I, can, will you talk to them for me? Even if they weren't in my downline, I, w I would talk to people. And I would tell them to use that, that, use me as that guideline for them. But I also taught people to put on their list, when they were making a list of who they were going to talk to, to put anybody and everybody on the list. Don't worry about talking to them right now. Right. Because people, when they make a list of people that they're going to talk to, and I know now we have the internet and we do things a lot of different ways too, but we also make our list still. I don't care. So write everybody on your list and then work with your upline at what time you'll approach this person that you consider your chicken list person. Yeah. Because your upline probably isn't afraid to talk to that person with you. And, and also, and, if you're... If you're saying, you know, oh, I'm, I'm going to go talk to that person when I'm making more money, well, more is not a definable thing. So it's always going to be more than more and more than more than more and so on and so forth. And right. you'll never get to that point. Right. Right. Exactly. So when you were, I mean, go back to your, your story of when you, you were building and you saw success, but then the company folded. And how did you feel about that first? I mean, that, that happens. That happens with any company, be it right. a network marketing company or otherwise. I mean, IBM has 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 had layoffs very recently um and and several times and you know it happens on both sides but how did you feel when you had built all this and it just went away well you know, of course it was devastating because i was making six figures a month you know and so it was a devastating thing but also i felt kind of infallible and what i'm going to share with you is going to tell you a story about a lesson that I learned and how I needed to learn that lesson. So what happened is I moved away from that company that I couldn't be authentic with, and that was just me and a personal decision. And I joined forces with a friend. We partnered up, and we went into real estate. We built houses in Arizona and Florida and Mexico, and me with having built the houses with my former husband and you know having had a house on the cover of you know better homes and gardens which is something that had happened um i love design and oh i was loving this i was going to step back from the network marketing arena and go into this arena yeah. had the money to be able to do it and thought we were kind of protected ourselves because Florida, Arizona, uh, Mexico. I even bought a couple of apartment buildings in Detroit. <laughs> All at the wrong time. Yeah. All at the wrong time. And we could start to feel it crumble because by the time we got them done, we couldn't sell them for what we thought. Then we lowered the price and then lowered a little more, lowered a little more. And here we are crumbling. And we had some people that kind of invested in some of these houses as well with us as partnering situations. So now, oh my gosh, obligated to these people. It was a nightmare. And I, I, I couldn't believe it was happening to me because everything that I had always visioned always had worked out for me since a little girl. You know, I visioned this, I was going to make it happen, I could work to make that happen. When I got into IBM, I moved up and up and up and up, and then I went over to this network marketing company and it shot like a superstar there and taught and trained people and got accolades for that and always felt like I did it with a heart. Mm -hmm. And here I am really just trying to help myself. And this was going to be my hurrah. I was going to sit back and write my book after I did this thing. And it's crumbling. Yeah. Simultaneous to that, I had a number of things happen. And so simultaneous to going through this, uh, working with lawyers and all this stuff with the properties, I had a younger sister discover that she had breast cancer. Another sister was um, actually found dead. Um, 
I found out I had the breast cancer gene and had to have a double mastectomy. Didn't have to. I made the choice to have a preventative double mastectomy, similar to what Angelina Jolie did, for example, this uh, past year. Um, and there it was all the stuff going on with me from a health and a wealth perspective that was overpoweringly devastating. And I sunk down into depths. And there were days when I couldn't even put one foot in front of another. And I had to work through that and figure out what is it, you know, go back and finally say, what is it that I'm good at? What can I, what can I do to give to the world? I, I, I'm not done, you know? And, um, so I, I really did soul searching and I realized that in the process of me going through life and having everything happen really the way I had expected it to happen because I manifested things and they would happen. In the process of doing that, I got maybe to a certain point where I had become cavalier uh, towards other people's situations. When somebody was saying, oh, geez, Jan, you know, I have a hard time talking to this person on my chicken list, as you just brought up. Right. Or I don't know if I can do that. I'd say, well, just you know, put your mind to it. You know, you can do it. And I, I didn't really feel for them the way I felt. I now think I could have felt for them. Because anybody can do it. You can do anything you put your mind to. I mean, I was a perfect example of that. I've gone through all kinds right. of problems. But you, kind you, know? of, you, you, you get distanced from that because you right. You don't remember how hard it was to overcome it originally when you were in the basement and writing backwards on a piece of paper. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so I, it started resonating with me that, Jan, you needed to go through this to put yourself back in touch and realize that everyone has a point, and maybe their point is a low, lower threshold than yours. Right. And that's okay. Recognize that when you're dealing with people. And when you're working with them, never lose sight of that. And I think I have lost sight of that a little bit. And then come back and say, okay, what is it? What is it that you're really good at? I'm a business person. Yeah. I've got a finance background. I've got the corporate background. I've, I've been through, you know, network marketing. I coached all kinds of people in building. I had thousands and thousands of people in my downline. I'm good at all those things combined. And so eventually as I did that, one thing started leading to another, another. I started getting on the internet and getting online and I spent a lot of time observing what other people did. And interestingly enough, I went through the situation of realizing when you get to a certain point, Brian, and you've got people that are working and doing stuff for you, yep. now you just want people to work and do stuff for you. Right. I wanted to get out there and on the internet and have work, you know, and have people do stuff for me, but I didn't know how to tell them what to do because I didn't know how to do it. Right. So how do you hire somebody to do this for you if you don't know what to, what to tell them to do? Right. You have to partner with them, but you also have to communicate with them. You have to communicate with yeah. them. You have to when they're not doing what you're supposed to be. They're supposed to be doing. So I had to take a step way back, bring myself down, and learning through reading is not my forte. My forte is learning through someone showing me. And then, you know, you want to get somebody to show you. Well, so I'd look at all these videos. And I, I had to really stop and say, Jen, you've got to do this. You've got to sit down. And I get distracted easily, you know, that ABC thing. Sit down. And I said to myself, no matter what, I'm going to figure out how to get a video recorded, set up a camera, Upload it to my computer, get it on, create a blog, put it on there, write it. I mean, even going through WordPress, 
and figuring out how to do that, how to get it up there, how to, I'm going to do it no matter what. And it was so painstaking. Behind me in this cabinet, I have like 10 manuals of binders of stuff I've printed out and would go back through and read because I have to, I have to read real, it takes me really long. I have to, I have to read it over and over and over. So I print it out and look at it. But if I read something, I can then repeat it very easily. It's like, right. you know, mine photographs it. So that's what works for me. So consequently, what that's helped me do is for people who are struggling and trying to learn how to do those things, I'm a really good person to talk to because I'm not talking clear up here. Right, right. I know how to tell them the basics, the bones of it, because I made myself go through that. And so that's a recent thing. You know, I've got the writing backwards as a child, but I've got this recent thing that I've gone through and, and gotten myself out there now, and right. it's a well, accomplishment. Because the, I mean, you know, the, the story of you as a child going through the dictionaries and doing that for your homework, it's, you know, it's, it's a great story and it's a great kind of lesson, but it's not really applicable. In right. Like, like the mindset of it is and the insight of it is, but you can't, you know, take that and say, well, I'm going to do that with, you know, making a website. So, right. so one of the quotes that I found on your website, which I loved, was um, throughout my career, I had come to realize that my passion and my gift is leading other people to success. And and you were just talking about education and teaching and that your whole goal was to put yourself in a place where you could relate and and have that experience and then communicate it. And obviously you can't get to be the top, you know, or the, the number three income earner in a company without other people. So how... How have you communicated that vision to other people in your team, and how has it affected you when when the company failed? It was hard for you, but it was also hard for other people. And and a lot of people see leaders as distant, but I know that you have a really close connection to you know all the people that you work with. And so how did how did that work? What did you do? Well, from the standpoint of the people that I work with, I still have people that from back in that first venture are with me today. And I feel good about that. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I still have people that worked for me at IBM that are really good friends call upon me. As a matter of fact, one who worked for me years and years and years ago is still at IBM and said, Jan, I've got to move on. <laughs> and I'm like, you're right. And so I'm working with her now, you know, together with her. And I think it's because I really love understanding the story of an individual and seeing how their story fits into what it is that they want to do. A very hard thing about me with this interview with you is that it's hard for me to be interviewed because I want to ask you. <laughs> I want to talk to you, Brian. You know, how did this started? How did you do that? Gee, where'd you start from? Well, and get to know you. Then knowing that story of you then moves me forward to thinking, oh, hey, gee, you'd be really good at this and kind of bringing in an inspiration. Right. And so I really look at every person that I work with where they're coming from, what their story is, and then try to intuitively help them find a place, a thing that they're good at. Um, and then help them in network marketing. You can use so many aspects of yourself to be good at something. If you're a focused person, that's good because you just stay focused on doing this. If you're a creative person, that's good because you can think of how to do something in this way. If you are um, really determined, that's good. If you've got a background that you came from success, um, that's good because you can you can relate to success and right. you can share with others how to do it. You can find something in anybody. And so I think I took each individual and work with them individually to help them in their surroundings. Yeah, and, and you talk about stories, and you, you speak a lot of that on your website, and, and I love, for anyone who knows me personally, I love stories, probably a little too much, but, you know, <laughs> when, you're, when you're reading something, at least when I'm reading something, I go through and I, I highlight, like, the big impactful things. Like, even if it's a biography, 
And it's like the moment where, you know, and then so-and-so did this. I'm like, that is a true testament to their character or their mindset. And, you know, it just, I connect with it and I highlight it. And so you can do the same thing with a person is that, you know, you kind of point out like, no, that that's really awesome. What you just did right there because of this and you, you, you know, pay a compliment. But mm-hmm. the reason that I highlight things is so that I remember them because then I, you know, oftentimes will tell them to other people. And I think a lot of times people don't realize that the things that, you know, are, are these things that are being highlighted can be so helpful and passionate to other people. Right. They think that they don't have anything offered to, or anything to offer, but their story is so valuable regardless of what it is. Yeah, exactly. So exactly. how do you, how do you help people tell their own stories? I mean, that's, you know, perfect segue into that question is you have a video on this, which I'm going to link below, which I loved, but how do you work with people that, you know, just are, are just getting started and they're trying to, to formalize their story and, and communicate it to other people to either sell, recruit, or just build relationships? Well, I think what I do is I talk to the person individually. And as we're talking, I will pick out something in them that they might not even recognize in themselves. And, you know, I find that And everything has to be with heartfelt honesty. Because if you compliment someone just for the sake of a compliment, and it's not really true, people know that. They get it. They feel it. But sometimes, or a lot of times, I will figure out a way, and I do this purposely, because I, I love bringing out or making someone smile about themselves. So I will find something in them that they might not even know that affects me about them and you for instance the fact that you have done your research and have found things on you know my website and have highlighted those things um, that's really important but what's more important about it is really how you saying that affected me when you did you saying that made me say geez, that's cool. I hadn't even realized that that was on there. (laughs) And the fact that he noticed that, boy, that really makes me feel good. So, Brian, did you realize that when you do those things, how inspiring that is to someone? Um, Because, you know, you may or may not know that. You're intuitive and maybe do. But by using that as an example with someone, I'll say you don't realize how inspirational a person you are. You don't realize that how you came through that particular obstacle, do you know how inspiring that is for people? You want to highlight that obstacle that you came through. And I think I can feel when a person is welling up mm-hmm. and are prideful in what I'm, I can feel it on the phone when I'm talking to them, just how they're saying, oh, that I've hit a chord. And then we move on from that particular thing to say, let's focus on this now when you're dealing with people. Right. And it, it, it's fun for me. And it's fun for me. It's like each person is a child. Mm-hmm. And then from there, they build their team of people doing something they're feeling really good about because I'm kind of inspirational to them. They become an inspirational person. And it helps them notice, thing in other, notice things in other people. And the, the really funny thing is, and I know that a lot of people struggle, is that they can hear that and they can hear the value in that and, and helping other people and, and inspiring other people, but they don't understand how that translates to growing their, their business. And, mm-hmm. and a lot of times if they really just start doing it, then they're like, oh, I'm getting a paycheck. I don't know why. Uh, right. But because it, it, you inspire someone and then they, they inspire other people, but in turn, inadvertently or just as a byproduct, that, that grows a business. And, mm-hmm. and so, um, and I'm kind of going to take a different turn here because I, every time you move your head, it reminds me to ask the question. Um, okay. but I see, cause it's very colorful, the four hour work week behind you. Yeah. And, and I, one of my favorite books, um, just because of the method of thinking, but you talk about, you know, you were doing this, this focus on mindset when you were a little girl and now you're focused on helping other people, but you still have to work on your mindset. So what are you what are you, what's your self-talk? Like, what are you reading? What are you saying to yourself when you charge yourself up so that you can help other people and charge them up? Well, I am somebody who goes in a lot. And I find that I learn a lot by doing that and trying different methods of doing that. And so what I do is 
Every morning and every night, I spend time by myself, if it's just kind of in meditation, and or I'll take a break in the day and just stop and say, what's going on with you here, Jan? And, and I'll meditate. I got to something very, very recently in myself that I learned that's helped me just since I've gotten to this. And that is that um, a long time ago, and I've told this story, kind of I found myself telling the story for some reason to people. Um, and then I thought, why am I telling this story? The story is when I was a little girl, we went on a vacation. I think the only one we ever went on. And all of the kids weren't born yet. And because there's 12 years between me and the youngest out of seven. And I was maybe nine. And we were all packed in the back seat, and the seat belts weren't required then, kind of thing. We were going up, to, I lived in Illinois, going up to Wisconsin, and I fell asleep and woke up only to find out everybody was just talking about how they stopped at a coffee shop and they all got donuts, but you were asleep, so you didn't get any. I feel the same way when I miss the cart and on the plane and they go by and I don't get peanuts. I feel the same and, way. You know? And and so and so I first of all I think about that now and I go, I can't believe my parents didn't bring me a donut. You know, give me one. I would never with my boys just say, Oh well, too bad you were asleep, let alone live in the car this day and age, you know. But they were talking about oh, we had a donut, you didn't have one and how that thought, but we never got donuts. We never got anything. We were so poor. So that was a big deal then. And that has somehow, by telling this out loud to you now, maybe I can get the story out of my mind. <laughs> somehow, I missed out. Yeah. And so there has been time, there have been times when I've realized, I'll go from one thing to another, to another, instead of sticking and staying focused on something that I'm doing, because I'm afraid I'm going to miss out yeah. on something else. And that's not good. You know, setting your mind that you're going to do something and sticking with it and going through it, especially in our industry, is the way to do it. But that goes way back to this little incident that I had as a child when I missed out on something. And I recognized that just a couple of weeks ago. And I thought, geez, Jan, because you've told that story so many times, there's a basis to it. Right, right, right. So, you know, when I'm thinking back and when I go within, I really um, try to look at things for me that I learn, and then I, I can share them with others, and I can discover them in others. So I read books. One of my favorite books is Illusions by Richard Bach. Have you ever read it? No, no. Read this book. It's a small book. You can read it in, you know, a couple of hours, and you'll reread it, reread it. It is more of a, a light story about life. Right. Another really uh, book that I love is the book of secrets, which is Deepak Chopra. Yeah. And the book of yeah. secrets actually goes into how your body knows how to act within itself. Mm -hmm. And I can't repeat it. I, <laughs> I can't repeat it what he does. But your body basically knows how to give up something to be able to have something else go on with you. Each, everything in your body has a job. Mm -hmm. So why can't the world be like that? Right. And so you learn in life, um, actually, how, how if you could work like your body works. So that's a very deep, it's an awesome book. It's a very deep book. And I find those kinds of books, yes, business books, the four-hour work week and trying to figure out those kinds of things, um, you know, the habits of successful people, those kinds of things. I always read that stuff. I never read a novel. Right. You know, yeah. I, I read the things that are help me learn about me. The other thing I will tell you is that, and you've heard this probably over and over, you know, that we're, we teach what we're here to learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. you might find this yourself, I don't know, but while I'm speaking a lot of times in giving advice or coaching to people and something's coming out of my mouth and I'm using an example for them and I'm talking, there's a simultaneous conversation going on in my head that will say, 
Not a half bad idea, Jan. You ought to do it yourself. <laughs> I know the feeling. That conversation happens frequently. So, yeah. Uh, so for someone who's, I mean, okay, so we talk about stories and, and inspiration, I think, are two, which the stories inspire. But, I mean, breaking it down into those two and, and kind of coming up with an action item for people who are listening, what is someone that someone that uh, something that someone can do to either uh, identify or come up with a story that they already have? Um, and then how can they use that to inspire someone within 24 hours of watching this video? Okay. Um... I'd say go back like we did in this interview. Take time. And this is, this is something that isn't done in an hour. This is to set some time for yourself and say, I'm going to do this. And, and I'm going to spend this amount of time doing that. And one of the things I encourage people to do is to sit down and write out what they would do with their life on a day-to-day -day basis if money did not matter. And it's an exercise that really works because you say, oh, you know, I'd get up and, you know, I'd do this and then maybe I'd, oh, I'd fly to Paris. Oh, that's right, the kids are in school, you know, so I can't do that because, oh, but wait, if money did not matter, then I would have a tutor for the kids. You know, or, oh, you know, I, I've got dad in the hospital. I can't. Well, if money did not matter, I could do this. Right. If you go, if you get rid of every obstacle in your scenario that comes into your mind, oh, I can't do that because of this, as you go through this, and this will take really... Do you recommend stuff. documenting the obstacles and how you're going to overcome them? Or? Yes, you, 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 you get rid of them. You say, well, if money didn't matter, I could get rid of that obstacle. And as you go through, you'll get down to who you really are. You're not just going to sit. You're going to, you know, is it the arts? Is it music? Is it, um, is, is it helping people? Is it philanthropy? Is it making money? Is it, what is it? Is it bicycle riding? I would bicycle ride every single day. I would ski every single day. I would, I would surf. I would just sit and read. Uh, I become the best winemaker. You know, what is it that you're passionate? Wine drinker. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm> drink <laughs> Make it and drink it. Test yeah. it. And, and so you get to what your passion is. Yeah. And when you get to what your passion is, you can then mold whatever you're doing in a network marketing. You can mold your passion into your story with people because now you've got your why. You need a why. You've heard that over and over. People are watching this and over and over they've heard this, that the why is the most important thing. Why are you doing this? I had to do this with myself. What is it I'm really good at? I, You know, yeah, I'm a business person. Yeah, I'm a coach. I, but what is, what's unique about me? And seriously, that's how I got to storytelling. Because people would always tell me all my life, Jan, oh, your stories are so great. Or, oh, you can, Jan, tell them the story about this. Tell them the story about that. And I thought, well, that's just, is that really a thing, a storyteller? And I thought, you know, it is. So I've wrapped my persona now around storytelling. And I'm quite amazed, actually, about how it can fit into anything because we are a book of stories our whole life is about stories yeah. but it took me quite a bit to get there so take that time do that work you have to do the work to get it done you know we always hear oh the grass is always greener on the other side well that's because those people are mowing it right yep you know they're doing the work to make it look good like that you've got to do that work and so if you Say, okay, I'm going to walk away from this, and maybe today I can't do it, but I'm setting up next Tuesday as the time I'm going to focus on this and figure out who I am. Your direction in what you're pursuing is going to be so much more um, streamlined because you're going to really have a handle on who you are. I think that's so important. I totally agree, and I love stories too, so if there's any other storytellers out there, make sure to... I'd say try and tell a story because I every time I tell a story, it gets shorter and more impactful. It keeps d getting distilled, and then you're able to inspire, help, or just make more people laugh. 
But mm -hmm, for sure. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on and sharing. And I mean, absolutely awesome. I have every resource we talked about linked below um, and people can tell their stories below as well as our podcast link. And uh, we look forward to having more from you in the future. Thank you so much again. Thank you so much, Brian. I really love this and you're doing an awesome job with this site. I've looked at all the people that you've interviewed. I feel prideful to be amongst them. And this is a resource that I'm really going to be sharing with people. I think it's awesome. Thank you very much.